Hey everyone, and thanks for taking the time to check out this video. For today's viewer requested presentation, I will be providing a review of the Fab Defense Complete SKS Chassis System with UAS Buttstock. A while back, I used this product basically as a prop for my Is the SKS Obsolete video, and since then, quite a few people have asked me to do a full review of it. Well, at this point, I do feel as though I've got an adequate range time to develop a reasonably balanced opinion on this stock, so I'm happy to fulfill that request. As a quick disclaimer, this is not a sponsored review. I purchased this item for full price using my own money. I am receiving no compensation for this review, and I have zero financial relationship to Fab Defense or any retailer that sells Fab Defense products. I realize that's probably obvious to many of you, but I do think it's an important disclaimer to make on any YouTube product review, even for smaller channels like mine. Either way, let's dive in. I'll try to keep this review as efficient as possible, starting with a bird's eye view of what this product is, how it fits into the market, and who it might be for. The Fab Defense Complete SKS Chassis System with UAS Buttstock is a drop-in polymer chassis designed to integrate modern ergonomics and enablers into the SKS platform. Specifically, it provides a folding buttstock with adjustable comb height, a pistol grip, an extended magazine release, four Picatinny rail portions, and five QD attachment sockets. It is compatible with all standard pattern SKS carbines to include long lug, short lug, and pressed and pin barrel varieties, although it does not preserve the ability to use any pattern of bayonet, so those will need to be removed prior to installation. Street price for this product is about $225, making it one of the more expensive options for a modern SKS chassis. Speaking of options, let's do a brief scan of where this product fits into the landscape of aftermark SKS chassis. In terms of entry-level options, the main players are the Choate Tool Folding SKS Stock, the ATI Strike Force, and the ProMag Archangel, all of which cost about $125. Sharing the mid-tier niche is the SG Works Bullpup Stock, which costs $225 to $310, depending on options. Premium options for SKS chassis are pretty much non-existent, with the only real option being the Sage International chassis, which is super cool because it's made by the same people who make the M14 EBR chassis, but these cost 750 bucks or so and are perpetually on back order. I've never actually seen one in stock before, which is probably a good thing because I'd probably be dumb enough to buy one. In any case, these are more of a theoretical option than an actual market offering. On paper, all of this makes the fab option look pretty good because in theory, it should offer a meaningful upgrade from those entry-level options, and yet it doesn't require transformation to a bullpup configuration, which many people are averse to, nor does it require taking out a loan or getting on a two-year wait list. So the last question, of course, is who is this for? Quite simply, this is for people who own an SKS and want to enhance its capabilities or otherwise fully exploit its potential as a utilitarian weapon system. There are many reasons someone might want to do this, ranging from prudent necessity to misguided ignorance and, of course, basic boredom. I'm not here to sort out those motivations, nor am I here to provide judgment or endorsement for them. I'm simply here to review the product. As a brief note, if you aren't happy with me for just glossing over the complex motivations that go into modifying an SKS and are interested in having a more thorough discussion on the nuances which come with modifying historically significant firearms, I do have a dedicated presentation on exactly that subject coming soon. Depending on when you're watching this video, that video might already be linked in the description. Like I said, that's a subject for another day, however, so for now, let's just get back to a straightforward product review. Okay, so now that we've established the more theoretical context of this chassis, let's address it as a physical reality. How well is it designed, how well is it made, and how well does it actually work? Overall, I've been a little disappointed with the Fab chassis. It's not terrible, and given the relatively small number of competitors it has, I do think it's probably the best option for some people, but it's definitely nothing special either. If I were to give this a letter grade, I would give it a C minus, as in the lowest possible passing grade. I do consider this to be passing because it does provide the fundamental capabilities that it advertises, and it does so without introducing any critical failure points. All that said, it also leaves a ton to be desired in terms of overall design, material quality, and ergonomic layout, and it absolutely introduces a number of non-critical failure points, so that's why I'm giving it the lowest possible passing grade. Let's break all that down. My immediate out-of-the-box impression of this stock is that it doesn't feel like something that is worth $225. That's a subjective impression, but an honest one. If I spend more than $200 on a piece of firearm furniture, I expect it to feel like mid-tier AR furniture. I'm not expecting Daniel or Knights, but I am expecting Troy or Midwest. I want it to feel solid in the hand, such that my first thought is, yep, that'll do. Unfortunately, that's just not the impression this chassis gives me. I'm not a material science guy, but this polymer feels a little too light and a little too cheap. I want to be getting that Magpul MOE warm and fuzzy, and instead I'm getting more Wish.com. Now let me be clear that I have not experienced any parts failure personally, nor more importantly still, would the failure of any of these polymer components actually interrupt the weapon's cycle of operations. Like the Kalashnikov action, the SKS action is self-contained, so the failure or destruction of the furniture will not bring the weapon down hard. 
That's what I was alluding to earlier when I distinguish between critical and non-critical failure points. All I'm saying right now though, is that I know what I like weapon furniture to feel like, and this isn't quite it. Installation of this chassis was relatively easy, but not smooth enough that I can just gloss right over that. A certain amount of polymer fitting was expected and I think is perfectly reasonable, but there was one area in which I think the specs were just plain wrong. My main assembly screw was a hair too short and consequently I had to deepen the screw head recess in order to get things to fit. I shouldn't have had to do that. In my opinion, it's much better to cut down a screw that is slightly too long than it is to remove polymer from a critical area in order to stretch a screw which is slightly too short. As an additional complaint, the screws used to mount the handguard to the gas tube are, in my opinion, too small. And despite my best efforts, I was being as careful as I possibly could be, I got a little bit of cross-thread action going on in one of them. In the end, I did get a good lockdown, but I really think they should have designed this to use thicker fasteners. Tiny screws finely threading into brass channels embedded in polymer are just asking for trouble and have no place on a weapon system like this, if you ask me. All that said, I was able to get a solid installation with relatively limited and objectively easy fitting. So from a purely go, no-go perspective, the installation was a go. So now that everything is assembled, let's talk about what I like and what I don't like about the actual performance of the chassis, because that's a mixed bag. To keep everything organized, let's refer back to our list of capabilities the stock was supposed to provide, which were a folding buttstock with adjustable comb height, four Picatinny rail portions, a pistol grip, an extended magazine release, and five QD attachment sockets. Let's start with the folding buttstock. In terms of the good, the folding buttstock does fundamentally work. When closed, it successfully reduces the total size of the weapon, and when open, it's a buttstock. That counts for something. It should also be noted that when we pair this capability with a 16-inch barreled SKS, like this Chinese commercial paratrooper, we really do have a compact and practical package, which is pretty cool. Another thing I like about this side folding stock is that it doesn't lock in the closed position, and instead is held tight to the receiver by spring pressure alone. That means that it isn't going to flop around on you, but you also don't need to rely on fine motor skills to deploy it. You can just grab it anywhere and pull it. That's a good design if you ask me. Finally, the bolt will cycle fine when the stock is closed, but only if the adjustable comb is in its lowest position. So we can call that good, but not great engineering. Regarding that adjustable comb, I guess it's a nice feature, which does accommodate a wide range of shooter preferences. However, I really don't like this exposed spring here. To me, this just reeks of lazy engineering. It's a glaring non-critical failure point that could have easily been shrouded or recessed. So now for the more serious negatives. Although the folding mechanism is user-friendly and functional, it is weak. The locking surfaces here are polymer roll pinned into polymer, and there's absolutely no way that this would hold up to serious adversity. It's probably strong enough in this direction, but if we flip this over and apply any real bending force in this direction, the lockup is definitely gonna fail and probably fail in such a way that prevents it from ever properly locking again. This wouldn't take the weapon out of the fight, but I suspect that the inevitable solution would be to permanently fix the stock in the open position using duct tape or nails, screws, whatever you might have. In other words, I do think that if one of these stock systems actually ended up in truly adverse conditions like combat, I think it would only be a matter of time before it turned into a fixed stock, and that kind of defeats the purpose of having a folding mechanism in the first place. Just as a reference point, we are now looking at a side folding mechanism actually designed for the rigors of combat, courtesy of an Arsenal SAM 7 SF. This allows us to appreciate that the fab lockup is really a recreational grade toy by comparison. The last thing I have to say about this stock is that the non-adjustable length of pull is quite long. Fab Defense lists the LOP at a rather staggering 14.3 inches, although my measurement comes out a little closer to 13.8. Either way, we're talking about a non-adjustable length of pull, which is longer than an M16A4 and nearly two inches longer than a factory SKS stock. Now, I already know that some guys are gonna celebrate this as a sorely needed correction, but I don't. In my opinion, a non-adjustable length of pull should never exceed the broadly accepted M16A1 standard of 12.9 inches. This is the closest thing we have to a true one size fits all. And if you really need more than that, it's easy enough to craft your own spacers or extensions. By contrast, it's nearly impossible to reduce a length of pull, especially on modern polymer stocks like this one. In other words, even if you do find the factory SKS length of pull uncomfortably short, which many, many people do, two inches is a serious leap in the other direction, which I suspect that many people will find to be an overcorrection. What's more annoying than just the length of pull, however, is just how that length of pull stacks up with the positioning of the accessory rails. So let's get into that now. Maybe you don't mind a 14 inch length of pull, but if you're gonna comfortably mount this rifle and access the accessory rails with your support hand, you better have long, long arms. I really can't emphasize this part enough. I have a fairly average, if not just slightly below average build at 5.9, but when I shoulder this carbine, the accessory rails might as well be on the other side of the room. 
This is by far my least favorite feature of this chassis and the number one reason I will probably never use it again after I complete this review. Just for a sense of scale here, the furthest available Picatinny slot on a standard M4A1 carbine is 12 inches forward of the trigger. The closest available Picatinny slot on the Fab UAS chassis is 16 inches forward of the trigger. The consequence of this, at least for me, is that it is super uncomfortable to activate my weapon light, and it's literally impossible for me to use a vertical foregrip. Despite this being, by most measures, the smallest SKS that I own, the way it's laid out makes me feel like a child holding a man's rifle, and that is not what I want in a fighting carbine. I want to positively control a weapon and crank it into my body. And that's something I'm used to being able to do with most weapon systems that have ever been put in my hand. I can't do that with this, and I hate that. In other words, as critical as it is to be able to mount accessories on an SKS, it's also important to be able to reach them. So unless you are six foot something with gorilla arms, don't get too excited about that part. The positioning of these rails is fine for a bipod and optic, but it's really quite poor for grips and other enablers, unless, like I said, you've got really, really long arms. So aside from the self-limiting positioning of the accessory rails, it also needs to be noted that they are made of polymer. They are reasonably solid and infinitely better than having no rails at all, but once again, this is a recreational grade mounting solution, and that's far from ideal, especially at this price point. Speaking of far from ideal at this price point, let's turn our attention now to the top rail specifically, which is the most important rail considering it is intended for red dot or other non-magnified optics mounting. The rail is integrated into the replacement handguard and has a channel cut through it so as to not interfere with the use of standard iron sights. Credit to Fab Defense on this one, that was a pretty good design and it actually lets you get a functional sight picture using your factory irons even when an optic is installed, and that's pretty clever. Unfortunately, that is the only positive thing I have to say about this design. The specific question I've got on this chassis more so than any other has been whether or not this top rail holds zero. And the short answer to that question is no. There are two really obvious issues with this design. First, the optics mounting surface is only as stable as is your gas tube because it's not mounted to anything other than your gas tube. Now, some SKS patterns naturally do have a fairly tight and repeatable lockup for their gas tube, and for those that don't, it's usually very possible to do some hand fitting and or shimming of the ferrule such that those tighten up as well. But that said, it's really not what that part was designed for, and it's never going to be perfect. Second, this is an unshielded polymer rail mounted directly to a gas tube. I'm no expert in thermodynamics, but I know enough to tell you that that's a bad idea. The more rounds you put through this, the hotter that gas tube is gonna get, and the more likely it is that your point of aim decides to go on a little rumspringer. Now, I said the short answer to the holding zero question was no, and that's because the long answer involves acknowledgement that there are different types of zeros. The obvious definition of a zero is a true zero, as in zero deviation. This mount will not hold a true zero. Now, there's also something we might call a combat effective zero, which is based on the reality that some amount of deviation does not eliminate the massive force multiplication which comes from a single aiming point optic. This is why we see guys in the Middle East and North Africa with super janky optic setups, like Chinese airsoft scopes zip tied directly to their barrels. Obviously, that example is kind of pushing it, but it's based on the empiric reality that in many combat situations, the guy who can shoot a beach ball sized group quickly outlives the guy who can shoot a baseball sized group slowly. And yes, there is a point at which optical deviation becomes so great that it's actually worse than just using iron sights. However, I think that point is farther away from true zero than most people recognize. As terrible of an optics mounting platform as this is, or suboptimal, I guess I should say, the reality is that at least in my testing, it did hold an adequate combat effective zero. I wasn't shooting groups on paper, and I'm sure if I was, those groups would have been abysmal compared to what I can do with iron sights on the flat range, but that's not what this product is for. So I got a rough zero at 25 yards and I rapidly engaged targets from everywhere from very up close to 200 yards out. And it worked fine for that. I was able to effectively put hits on target quickly. And that's what this product is for. Additionally, after removing my gas tube and reinstalling it, I didn't notice any substantial shift in point of impact. Between you and me, I'm sure there was one, but my point is it didn't make the difference between me hitting and missing a torso sized target. As per the emerging theme of this review, this is an uninspired and recreational grade mounting system, but it's definitely better than no optics mounting system at all, and that counts for something. Now, with all that said, I would be remiss to not mention that just because something technically works doesn't mean that I think you should settle for it. A true zero is even more combat effective than a combat effective zero. If I was serious about creating a practical SKS setup and I was using this chassis, I would personally ignore the handguard rail altogether. I wouldn't even bother installing it. And I would use a more secure rear sight mounted adapter like the product from Bad Ace Tactical. 
All right, so at this point, it probably seems like I pretty much trashed this chassis up and down, but there are still a few things to talk about, and in fairness, the rest of what I have to say is overwhelmingly positive. First is gonna be the ergonomics of the pistol grip. I've already complained about the material feeling a little bit cheaper than I'd like, but aside from that, it's honestly excellent. The SKS was not designed to use a pistol grip, but you would never guess that when you feel this in your hand. It feels extremely natural, it presents the trigger perfectly, and as an unexpected bonus, it really elevates the actuation of the SKS safety lever. Just having that extra surface area to stabilize my fire in hand allows me to quickly and accurately manipulate the safety in a way that I can't do with a standard configuration carbon. With this setup, I found myself intuitively putting my weapon on safe whenever it came off target, just the way I shoot an AR or a modernized AK. And that is not normally how I shoot an SKS. That's just one example of how this chassis was very successful in modernizing the feel and manual alarms of this weapon. Also, the pistol grip does have an integrated storage module, and I personally like those. Next, the extended magazine release lever is awesome. It's cleverly designed and offers a significant ergonomic advantage. I can't comment on how this chassis performs with detachable magazines, because I personally hate duckbill magazines. However, even with the factory magazines, it really adds to the speed and usability of the system. Also, the way this works is that it doesn't replace any components. All it does is give you mechanical advantage over the pre-existing magazine release. So once again, if this component breaks, you're not gonna lose your magazine release, you're just gonna go back to the standard release. It's like that old Mitch Hedberg joke about how escalators can't actually break, they just temporarily turn into stairs. That's a good design. Moving on, the QD sling swivels are reasonably well-placed, ambidextrous, and steel lined, so no complaints for me there. I wish they had built the optics rail to be as robust as their sling attachment points, to be perfectly honest. Adding a modern sling is a simple and effective way to elevate an obsolete weapon system, so that's another thing this chassis does a very good job of. Finally, this chassis does have a spring-loaded backplate which allows for weapon takedown, and while it's a little finicky, it does work. It's honestly very unclear to me why they didn't just leave this area exposed. It kind of seems like the presence of this part is actually causing the exact problem that it's solving, but technically it works and I don't see it as a failure point, so once again, no complaints for me, I guess. And that's pretty much the breakdown, guys. So now let's go over a quick summary and some parting thoughts before we close this thing out. If for whatever reason you want or need to depend on the SKS as a serious use weapon system, it would behoove you to find a way to mount a modern sling, optic, and light. Additionally, enhanced ergonomic features such as a pistol grip, folding stock, and extended magazine release really couldn't hurt. The Fab Defense chassis is a relatively simple way to basically check a lot of these important boxes. However, in my opinion, it does so using substandard design features and inferior materials, at least for the price point. To its credit, it does not introduce any critical failure points, and that is very important. But on the other side of the coin, it doesn't even come close to matching the ruggedness of the weapon system it is designed to complement. It's kind of like putting a sweater on a Rottweiler. It might look good in pictures, but the reality is that dog has gears where that sweater just can't keep up. As an additional complaint, I do think that this is fundamentally set up ergonomically for very, very big people. So if you're one of those people, it might be perfect for you, but for end users like me, this is extremely obnoxious and needlessly reduces its potential capabilities. So do I recommend this product? Like I said before, it's better than nothing. Despite all of the concerns I raised, my example has honestly performed very well for me so far, and my most material complaint is that it doesn't fit my body type. So with that in mind, I'll say this. Considering the limited options available, I do think this is a pretty good option for tall guys with long arms. It's not perfect, but it might just be the best solution for you. If you are not a tall guy with long arms, I would personally advise looking into other options. For example, speaking only for myself, I can say that if I had to set up an SKS for serious use, I would probably just put a red dot on a rear side adapter, such as the Bad Ace Tactical product. I'd hose clamp a flashlight to the fore end, and I might modify the sling attachment points to use more modern slings. Don't get me wrong, I really like the folding stock, pistol grip, and extended magazine release of the Fab Defense product. So much, in fact, that I could get over the disappointing build quality. But the thing I can't get over is that length of pull and that insane reach to the accessory rails. Sling optic and light are non-negotiable, but everything else is, and I'm personally going to choose a comfortable weapon lockdown over those other features. And that's the video, guys. I apologize if you were hoping I would have more positive feedback, but that is my honest review. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to pop them in the comments. I'm pretty good at getting back to people in a timely manner. Other than that, if you did find this review helpful, I would greatly appreciate you letting me know by doing the YouTube algorithm stuff, like, comment, and subscribe. Thanks again for taking the time to check out this video, and I hope you have a great rest of your day.